This morning I get to present on the five big trends impacting Colorado's growth, transforming Colorado. So growth, um, these are going to be the main takeaways from today's presentation and we'll start out uh, with that growth. So Colorado's continued to or is expected to continue to outpace growth uh, in the nation, growing roughly twice as fast as the national average. However, when we put that growth uh, within historical context of Colorado's growth, we'll notice that it's slowing. As Chris mentioned, in addition to the labor force, the population growth and job growth will be slower um, also, and a lot of that slowing is the result of a lower level of births, higher level of death, as well as lower le net migration much of which is due to the fact that Colorado's aging. So one of the most significant demographic factors impacting Colorado's growth over the next few years is going to be the aging of Colorado. And the aging's happening as a result of two different things. One is increased life expectancy, and the other are the birthdays of those baby boomers, that very large generation born 1946 to 1964, the first of whom turned 65 just after 2010. But in addition to aging, Colorado, as well as the nation, is also supposed to expected to continue to diversify. And the reason for which is a much younger, much more diverse population aging within Colorado. And the number one question we've been asked as we've been giving presentations throughout this past year has been to what impact the legalization of recreational cannabis has had on Colorado's population and our number of jobs. So, We've crafted the agenda this afternoon to help us answer that question. We'll be bringing in the experts, but I'll let you know what we know. So first, a bit about our methodology. So our population forecasts begin with an economic demographic modeling system. So we start with the job forecast that Chris just pre presented, subtract out a uh, forecast of multiple job holders and commuters to arrive at a labor demand. And then we run a cohort component model where we take forecast fertility and mortality, add in births and deaths, add in a, an assumption for net migration, multiply those times a forecast of labor force participation rates by age group, and arrive at a labor supply. We then need to make those the labor supply equivalent to the labor demand, and we resolve those differences using net migration. And this is why. This chart's similar to one of the charts that Chris showed, where we have the blue bars that represent Colorado new jobs. This is for each five-year period ending beginning in 1980 and then goes throughout the forecast period through 2040. And you can see the relationship between those new jobs and net migration to the state. So the red line represents net migration. And then right near the middle of that chart, you can see where there's somewhat of a discrepancy, and that's the five-year period ending in 2010. And we're often asked the question, why Colorado continued to, to have in-migration throughout the Great Recession when we were losing jobs at the time? And there were a couple really good reasons for that. And that includes the fact that Colorado continued to enjoy a lower unemployment rate than the nation as a whole. And then in addition, we continued to grow jobs in the professional and health sectors, even though we lost a significant number of jobs in construction and manufacturing. And then you'll note that in the forecast period after we get out past 2020, that level of net migrants is actually expected to exceed the, the level of new jobs. And the reason for which is actually directly tied to Colorado's aging and that we'll have approximately one million persons aging out of Colorado's labor force over the next decade. And as a result, we'll, have an, we'll need to replace workers leaving the labor force in addition to bringing in folks for each one of those new jobs. So as I mentioned, uh, Colorado's relative unemployment rate to the nation is a very important variable that we look at in terms of uh, our competitiveness uh, throughout the country. So this chart shows the green line is that Colorado net migration number. It begins in 1978 and goes through today, 2015, while the orange line is the U.S. unemployment rate minus Colorado's. So you can see how highly correlated they are. The higher those bars are, the lower Colorado's unemployment rate was relative to the nation, and as a result, we had folks move into the state. But our first two big trends, growing and slowing. 
So this chart shows Colorado and U.S. growth rates. It begins in 1990 and then extends through our forecast horizon of 2050. The green bars represent Colorado's growth rate and the orange line for the United States. As you can see, Colorado's has been and is expected to continue growing at about twice that national average. But when we put the growth of Colorado currently, which is right about the middle of the chart in context of that historical growth in the 1990s, you can see we're significantly slower than we were then, and in addition are expecting a continued slowing. And the reasons for which, we have to look at the reasons for population change. So population changes as the result of a birth, a death, or a mover. The burst minus death is known as natural increase, and that's the blue part of the bar. This chart begins in 1970 and goes all the way through our forecast period of 2050. And you can see the variation, uh, the ups and downs caused by bursts in that blue part of the bar. And then the red line is net migration, are those who moved into the state minus those who moved out, which is much significantly higher than our natural increase and in also has much more volatility in it than the natural increase. But most recently, if you look towards the middle of the, of the chart, so as Irv mentioned, uh, last year we grew by about 100,000 people. But 30,000 of that was births minus deaths, or in, uh, babies. But previous to that, you can see the decline in the number of births that occurred during the Great Recession. That's not that unusual. Uh, we tend to see a lower level of births during recessionary periods, however, this last session, we saw a significantly lower number of births. And so this chart shows the percent change in the birth rate by age of mother from 2009 to 2015. And you can see those significant declines for young mothers uh, throughout Colorado. This happened nationwide as well. There are a couple good reasons for which, if, if we point to the research that's been done. So long-acting reversible birth control uh, became much more widely available. And in addition, there was an MTV show, 16 and Pregnant, that they credit with some of that decline um, as well. But we did see increases in the older female fertility. And so the big question that remains is to what extent this younger cohort of females, as they age into those older age groups, will continue to push up those fertility rates in the older age groups. But so what that looks like at the county level, once we apply all those, our expectations for growth from 2015 to 2050. This chart uh, shows growth rates over that annual average growth rates over that time period. The darkest counties growing the fastest. So the darkest counties on this map are located along the Front Range and then also along that I-70 corridor out on the western slope, all growing at or above the U.S. annual average growth rate. The lightest counties on this map, mainly concentrated on the Eastern Plains and then Southern Colorado, are expected to grow slower than the U.S. annual average rate, which is 0.6 percent over that time period. And then the lighter orange color in the middle, those growing above the U.S. rate, but yet below the Colorado annual average. In terms of what that looks like in terms of total population change, um, again, the majority of that population change occurring along the Front Range. This past year, we met with Denver Regional Council of Governments to review our forecast. As a result, we kept roughly the same number of persons within the Denver metro area, but we did move about 100,000 of that population out of the city and county of Denver and into Adams and Arapahoe County as we get further out in that time period after 2040. Um, and then also continued growth on the western slope. You'll note we did do some declines specifically within the northwestern part of the state, and that was a direct result of the data Chris presented earlier in terms of the job, uh, natural resource extraction jobs that have declined, and then within the southeastern part of the state. So the eastern plains had seen population declines over the last several years. However, this past year, three quarters of them saw either a significant slowing in that decline or actually experienced growth over that period, um, ex with the exception being that southeastern corner of the state. So we have longer declines forecast for it. But the slower population growth, uh, the directly the result of our aging, our third big trend. So 
Although growth in Colorado has been disparate across the state, every single county grew in its population over age 65 from 2010 to 2015. Colorado's not an old state. Uh, we're, we're a relatively young state. What's unique about Colorado is how quickly we're aging. And so we were, we're the sixth youngest in the nation, so with our share of the population over age 65 at about 13%. But we're the third fastest in terms of our growth in the 65 plus population in the nation. What's happening over this next 15 years is that we're just gonna, we're catching up to the nation. We're gonna look a lot more like the nation by the time we're over. We're not gonna become an old state, but we're getting that 65 plus population rapidly. And it's one that Colorado does not have currently. Our median age is forecast to increase from 36.5 to 40.7 by 2050. But statewide, current residents aging are 95% of that growth. So I'm often asked, so Colorado's attractive, now all the retirees are coming here. No, they're still going to Florida and they're still going to Arizona. These are your neighbors. These folks already live here and they're just having a birthday. <laughs> but of course that, that varies by county. And so this map shows net migration share of that over 65 population increase this decade. So from 2010 to 2020, the dark red counties on this map are those that attract 65 year olds. So in addition to having their own residents turn 65, they're growing even faster than that because they're attracting migrants from other places in the state or outside of the state to move into their community. And this is being led by Broomfield County, who 44% of their growth over that time period is expected to be from net migration. Also Douglas County along the Front Range, Montrose and San Juan County on the Western Slope and then Yuma and Kiowa County on the Eastern Plains. The darkest blue counties on this map are all expected to grow in their population over age 65, but that growth is being depressed by the fact that they have out migration of the 65 and overs. Uh, and those leaders include Lincoln, Cheyenne, Prowers, Baca, Sedgwick, Dolores, and Mineral County. And the lightest counties on this map, the ones who are nearly white, all are about the same with the statewide average, and at least 95% of their growth is just from current residents aging. And so net migration in or out is not a very significant factor in their aging population. But as I mentioned, that growth is gonna be fast. So where's it gonna be the fastest? This is, map shows the forecast change in the population over age 65 between 2010 and 2020. And you can see it's fastest along the front range where we actually have some of our youngest population. And then also again, that I-70 corridor heading out on the Western Slope. Those counties that we expect to double in terms of their population over age 65, and again, this was just between 2020, 2010 and the next five years, 2020 include Elbert, Douglas, Park, Gilpin, San Miguel, Eagle, Grand, and Summit on the Western Slope. So what that population over age 65 is going to look like in terms of the other age groups within the state. So this chart shows share of Colorado's population by age group, that top line representing the population 25 to 44. This chart begins in 1990 in that first period 20 years there, 1990 to 2010, what we see is that decline in the share of the population ages 25 to 44 as the baby boomers aged out of that age group and aged into the 45 to 64 year old age group. And so that's the purple line that's increasing during the same time period. What's significant about those increases is that the 45 to 64 year olds are typically within households where they are at their peak earning years and also at their peak spending years. But what's happening this decade and next decade is that those baby boomers who caused the surge in the 45 to 64 year old share are now aging out of it and aging into the 65 and over population. The blue bar towards the bottom of the chart that you see that significant growth that's happening this decade and next. After 2030, we don't see much change in terms of the share of the population by age group. So it really is just that very unique, very large baby boomer age group that's forcing all of this change in Colorado. And that change is happening right now, and then it will level out over time. If this was a chart of the United States, we'd see that in 2030, the, pop the share of the population over age 65 actually exceeds the share of the population under age 18 by 2030. 
So that doesn't happen in Colorado, not at least until after 2050. And so Colorado will still remain a very young state. We're just aging very rapidly. <laughs> mm -hmm. But And as was mentioned earlier, for those of you who follow Crosstabs, our blog, uh, Barb did a terrific post last week, which focused on the impacts as a result of this aging population. They include economic impacts from retiree spending, changing housing needs, health care <coughs> demands, public finance concerns, as well as a tightened labor market. And so to look at that tightened lab labor market, so the labor force is going to continue to grow in Colorado but at a much slower rate than historical growth and slower than the population. This chart begins in 2010 and goes out through 2050. And so you can just see that differential between the population and the labor force growing from about 2 million today to 4 million by the end of the forecast period. And labor force uh, growth is caused by two things. It's, it's the share of the population within the working age group, which we looked at a minute ago, and then it's also the labor force participation rate by age group and the changes in it. So this chart shows those labor force participation rates by age. The blue bars represent today or 2015, and the red bar represents that growth out in 2050. And what we can see here is that we are forecasting growth in the participation rate for persons over age 65 throughout this time period. <coughs> However, the participation rate of someone over the age of 65 is so much significantly lower than someone in the population 45, say even 45 to 54 that we see down, severe downward pressure on the growth within the labor force. So everything's just going to slow down a little bit. But in addition to aging, we'll see increasing racial and ethnic diversity throughout the state. Uh, so the Hispanic, Black, Asian, and other minority share of the state's total population will increase from 29% in 2010 to 48% by the year 2050. Uh, what's interesting about this chart, so in 2030, we see that share will be about 38%. That's where the nation is today. Um, so we'll be there in about 2030, and then the nation uh, reaches 50% and is forecast to reach 50% by the U.S. Bureau of the Census in 2044. And Colorado will be at 48% by the year 2050. But the reason for these increases is that diversity is already in the state. It's just very young. And so that first line of grouping of bars is for the under 18 population. And the blue part of the bar is where we are today, and the red part is where we'll be in 2050. So that under 18 growing from 43%, Hispanic, Black, Asian, and other minority as a share of the total population to 58%. But where we see the most significant increases are in the older population as this younger, much more diverse population ages. And so those 65 and overs who are 16%, Hispanic, Black, Asian, and other minority, growing, uh, doubling really to 32% by the year 2050. So what are the impacts of some of that increasing diversity? Of course, there's health outcomes, uh, two of which are very important to our office, include fertility and mortality. In terms of the trends, is that much more diverse young population ages into their childbearing years? Um, and then social and cultural as well. One of the uh, cultural may include multi-generational housing. Those are some of the things we're looking at. And then, of course, the labor force. Uh, as entrance to the labor force and then preparedness of the entrance becomes important. So that particular age group that they are at the moment, uh, over the next five years, the share of our net increase in the working age population within the state uh, is 70, almost 70, 68 percent Hispanic, followed by Asians, whites, blacks, and then American Indians. And then our fifth and, and final trend for Colorado, cannabis. It's certainly the number one question we've been asked at giving presentations. What we do know is that the impacts of can cannabis, there are 10,000 plus jobs related to cannabis in the state of Colorado, and that's in, within the growing manufacturing as well as the retail. And as we've established earlier in the presentation today, job growth is absolutely represented to population or, related to population growth. So we're excited to see the remainder of the, the folks' experts' presentations this afternoon. However, Irv made a statement this morning, and he said it's important that you watch what we say because we know what we're talking about. But do we really? Um, so 
forecast error. Don't burst my bubble. I know. <laughs> I, I hope not to. Trust me. Um, so why review forecasts? It's actually a really important question. Uh, they can reveal continuity or changes in demographic trends over time, serve as a basis for improvement in our assumptions or in our methodologies, and they can also inform us about the limitations of demographic projections and what we can reasonably expect from them. Um, a book called State and Local Population Projections, written by Smith, Taman, and Swanson earlier <laughs> last decade, stated that most state and local population projections have a mean absolute percent error of 6 to 7 percent for 10-year projections and 11 to 15 percent for 20-year projections. Our office, when we had the opportunity to go back through and look at every projection we could get our hands on that was created between 1988 and 2005, we had an error of 5.2 percent, our 15-year, 9.9, and our 20-year, 14.3. Now, those are annual averages over time, and certainly migration is the most uncertain component within those. Um, here's where we thought we would be in 2015. So our 2015 current population estimate came in at 5,456,584. Back in 1990, so mind you, we were in Colorado, we were in the natural resource bus. This was pre all that phenomenal growth Colorado received during the 1990s. We did a 25-year forecast horizon and said we'd be at 4.1 million, which was 31% off. We knew that one was bad a long time ago. Um, and actually just a couple years later, and as a result, we did that major methodological shift to the way we do our population forecast now incorporating jobs. So as I mentioned, we were in the middle of the natural resource bust at that time in the late 80s, and we actually had more out migration from the state than we had in. And at that time, we did our forecast on the basis of historical net migration. So what did it look like before? and said that's what it was going to look like in the future. And I see heads going, no, don't do that. And you were so right on. And we don't do that anymore. And so we switched to that, that jobs forecast. So in 1995, we did a 20-year forecast, said we'd be 5.4 million. And we were under by less than 1%. In the year 2000, we had a 15-year forecast and said 5.499 million. Uh, again, less than 1% error. And in 2005, a 10-year forecast up to 5.7 million. Uh, this was before, prior to the Great Recession and 4.4% off. And in 2010, we did our five-year forecast and said we were going to be at 5.474 million and 0.03% um, error on that one. Yeah. So. Yay. <laughs> But that, of course, varies by county. And as we compiled all the projections that we have at the county level, this, on this map, we're looking at only 15-year forecasts. So those forecasts that were, uh, were done with a 15-year horizon between 1998 and 2000. The counties in green, we increased their accuracy over that time period. And actually, our most accurate forecast 15 years ago were for uh, Larimer. And, or Weld and Adams County, both off by less than 1%. Uh, and then the white area shows where that accuracy has been similar over that time period. And then the purple areas where the accuracy has not been increased. Um, and just a note, in 2015, if we were to look at the population in the state within those purple counties, it's 3%. So about 150,000 persons live within those purple counties. So that's another statement to the fact that the smaller the geography that you're doing the forecast for, the larger the error. Um, and I owe an apology to Lake County, who in 2000 we forecast exactly 100% off. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I remember that one very well. It was at a meeting like this, and I stood up there and I said, oh yeah, and Climax is going to reopen, and so we've adjusted their forecast, and the very next day the Rocky Mountain News headline was Climax not going to reopen. So for those natural resource extraction counties, um, you're much harder to forecast than anyone else. Um, and so I have time for questions. And if you wouldn't mind using the microphones still. I have a question. This might be for Chris. But where, is, uh, where are the cannabis jobs reported? in the LMI gateway? Agriculture <laughs> or manufacturing? I'm going to let Chris or? answer it, because Chris, <laughs> while he was at LMI, actually did an awful lot of work. And 
Adam will be able to answer this better. He did a good report on it. And one of the interesting things is that since it's not recognized nationally, there aren't really good industry codes for it. So it kind of varies a little bit there. But some of it is in agriculture there. But we do see retail. Uh, initially, every all the marijuana establishments uh, in our state were medical marijuana. So they were under um, other healthcare practitioners, I believe, there. So that's 621399. And then what we see now is in other uh, miscellaneous retail stores is where we've seen a lot of that uh, increasing. But then we see some in like agricultural services, as uh, Adam's report mentioned, that uh, you know the growing cycles can be um, really kind of manipulated. So there's certain companies that just specialize in coming in and trimming and harvesting and the like there too. And um, since the companies are vertically integrated, it's kind of tough. So they do kind of cross some boundaries right there. But we have found a few places where we've looked. And one of the interesting things, and one of the things that we were able to kind of identify some of those jobs is we have a number of counties that have opted out of uh, uh, marijuana, both medically and recreationally. So we can kind of use them as a baseline in certain industries and see what their growth was, and then look at other counties that have uh, marijuana and see what the growth was in those industries too, and just kind of compare them a little bit. So it's a, it's a complex thing, and you'll learn a little bit more about it this afternoon, but mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to track, but we can do, we're trying our best to do it right there overall. Thanks.